This episode is sponsored by Peterson Games, creators of the Cthulhu Mythos Sagas for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Stick around at the end of this video for more about their third and newest campaign, Dark Worlds. Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and today we'll be taking a look at the classic AD&D adventure, The Ghost Tower of Inverness. Written by Alan Hammack, the scenario was first released in 1979 as a tournament module. In 1980, it was published as a regular adventure module as the second in TSRC series, which was their competition scenarios. Coming in at only 32 pages, the scenario is pretty short. It's even shorter once you remove all the handouts and the maps, pre-generated characters and all that, leaving the adventure at only 16 pages long. A lot of modules, especially the older AD&D scenarios, started off as being tournament scenarios and then were changed and adopted to being you know, regular classic campaign scenarios for the general public. But one thing that makes this scenario interesting is that it gives the option to either be done in the regular campaign style or to be done in the competitive tournament style that it was originally written as. We get rules on how to score players as well as scorecards. The encounters are listed in a way as to how you would use them if this was a convention game. And I find it a really cool time capsule about how convention games worked 40 years ago. Normally at this part of my reviews this is where I say how I've run the adventure, but I've never personally run this one. Holy crap, are you finally breaking your I won't review it unless I play it rule? Nope, because I have played this adventure. Twice. The first time was about a hundred years ago when I was 15 years old, and we were run through this as it being just a regular campaign adventure, though our dungeon master did mix it with Hellraiser for an extra dose of awesome. The second time was earlier this year when the original author, Alan Hammack, ran a group of us through a tournament style at TotalCon, which was a really cool experience to do. And since I have played it, I can review it, offer my criticisms, my tips, and my suggestions. If you were smart, you'd have remembered to pull out your camera while you were playing with Hammack, but you didn't because you never do. Ever remember to take a picture. Too busy living in the moment, man. But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. Big, glorious spoilers. Spoilers that make you go, ooh. So, any players in the audience, if you ever want to experience this adventure, please stop here. But send your Dungeon Master this way to see if it would be a good fit for your group. Okay, Dungeon Masters, let's do this. The scenario hook is that long ago, a great and powerful wizard had a great and powerful gym that was called the Soul Gym, and he housed it in the tower inside of his fortress. The tower has long since been destroyed, but now another powerful magician, a mysterious wizard known only as the Seer, wants to retrieve the Soul Gym to keep it from falling into the wrong hands. I'll be honest, this Sia guy feels like a villain. Everything about him just radiates bad guy to me. But he's not. But if you ever wanted a wizard to secretly be a villain and suddenly show their true colors, this dude is it. Now, if you're doing this as a regular campaign game, then you would just have the Duke and the Seer just hire the heroes in order to retrieve the gem. But if you're playing this as tournament style and using the pre-generated characters, then the player characters are all criminals who the Duke promises to free if they go into this tower and get the gem for them. Meaning that this is less of a normal D&D game and more like Suicide Squad D&D style. After an incredibly long intro that Dungeon Masters should just paraphrase instead of reading all this to their players, the criminals and their monk companion, who, who isn't a criminal, so they're all criminals except for one who's a monk who did nothing wrong except for the fact that his monastery evidently owes some back taxes to the Duke, so the monastery was all like, hey, here you go, take Ricky. So once that introduction is out of the way, the heroes are then to buy their equipment off of this list. They have up to 25,000 gold in total to outfit themselves with whatever gear that they need. Honestly, I kind of dig this pre-adventure shopping spree that the tournament characters get to do. Now, all the characters, whether they're tournament or campaign play, also get this magic amulet that we can use to bring them back once they get the soul gem, where they all hold hands and they push a little button on it and they close their eyes and say there's no place like home and they're whisked back home like Dorothy. The PCs are given a letter stating that any treasure they find inside the fortress is theirs, but subject to attacks. They also get instructions on how to use this amulet. Dungeon Masters, I suggest that instead of just reading this to them, you print this out and hand this to them as a handout. Or you could turn it into some sort of cool artifact your players get to hold. 
or if you're doing this with one of the online tabletop programs, they could look at it because we're now in an age where nobody gets to play in the same room anymore. The scenario begins as the PCs are escorted to the ruins of Inverness and sort of dumped there. We get three maps of the place, the ruined keep with the rubble of the shattered tower in the middle, the dungeon level, and the ghost tower itself, which is one, gumdrop shaped, which I kind of find a little funny, and two, lacks any ghosts. Wait, there are no ghosts in the ghost tower? Yeah, I know. I mean, the cover makes it look like you're going to be battling ghosts, and that's going to be a thing here, but it's not. The Wandering Monster Encounters, which are used only if you do campaign play and not if you do tournament style, are sort of all over the place, with the basic 1-3 to three green slimes, the difficult 1-2 to two ogre mages, to the most feared opponent imaginable, an illusionist. Now that illusionist is pretty powerful, though there's no explanation as to how he got down into this lower area, so maybe he followed the player characters in, you know, planning on ambushing them, uh, so he might actually just be an NPC character that you might need to build up, rather than just having a random illusionist just wandering around here. The dungeon itself is done more in the funhouse style. Most of the creatures are in a suspended animation or whatnot until the heroes enter the room they're in or activate them in some way. Going back to the wandering monster, I find their presence, or their potential of being present, sort of odd in a place like this because it has sort of a master plan to it, and now we just got some random bad guys walking around, even though some of these rooms are kind of difficult to get into. So what I suggest that Dungeon Masters do is go ahead and roll these up in advance. Go ahead and place them in the dungeon wherever you want to have them, and incorporate them in some way where it looks like they were just intentionally placed here as part of the dungeon creator's master plan, uh, rather than just have them be random creatures that are wandering around here. Because the dungeon level is so old, some favorite player character spells, such as Lightning Bolt and Fireball, can cause miniature cave-ins, which can add a new risk. Or an added bonus if the player characters use them right. The fireball don't kill that mana core, the resulting cave-in might. Either way, I suggest that if you have any players that check the walls or the ceiling, you know, a thief or a dwarf or whatnot, they should have a way that they can tell that these walls and ceilings are very unstable, and they can see that it might be problematic to cast some of these more devastating spells, sort of a hint to your players before you just kind of go ahead and spring this on them. Much of this adventure is done as puzzles that challenge the players as much as the characters. The module even specifies that it is for experienced players more than just experienced characters. Several encounter areas are marked as being for campaign play and not for tournament play, so that's how you determine if you use them or not depending on which mode you're playing this adventure in. The module gives us several visual aids to hand our players, which is really cool. I've said before that I make no apologies about the fact that I am a handout game master. While I'm not going to give any sort of walkthrough about each encounter, there are a couple that I want to mention. Room 8 has a programmed illusion, with a giant ball that rolls after the player characters Indiana Jones style. However, it's kind of vague in its description here, with the person that gets crushed taking no actual damage, while the observers think that the victim has been crushed until the victim touches them. Personally, I'd like some sort of effect given to the victim, the person that gets crushed by this illusionary ball. If not damage, you know, have them be where they're paralyzed on the floor for a short amount of time or something. And also, I wish it had offered some sort of suggestion as to how the player characters might attempt to dodge or avoid this ball that comes hurtling down the passageway toward them, uh, such as a saving throw or whatnot. So maybe a saving throw versus breath weapon to kind of press yourself up against a wall or leap out of the way just in time before this thing comes crashing into them, and also having your players make some sort of saving throw as a way to avoid getting hit by the ball really sells them the idea that this is a real trap and not just an illusion that they're trying to avoid. Also, it makes it just really funny for the dungeon master to be watching the players leaping and diving and doing all these elaborate things not to get hit by this ball when there is nothing really there. Next is location 12 and 13, where the heroes are forced to play wizard's chess to pass through a room. We get a handout for it, and the colored floor tiles are noted, but I suggest that dungeon masters actually color the colored squares. Don't just make the players read what color they are, let them see what color they are. I don't see why that would make a difference. I mean, only an idiot would convince themselves that a certain color of the floor tiles actually meant something, and then just try to move around the room without stepping on a certain color like it was a landmine. <clears throat> um, yeah, only an idiot would convince themselves that the yellow squares were bad. You did that, didn't you? 
Anyway, the dungeon is laid out in four separate sections, each accessible through a different tower from above. In each section, the heroes will discover a magical piece of metal, and at the locked door at the end of each passage is a square indentation that the metal piece can fit inside of. Eventually, they should figure out that the pieces all link together, and once all four pieces are joined, they can be put inside any of the locked doors and they'll open up for them. Dungeon Masters, I encourage you to go ahead and print these pieces out, or you may maybe cut them out of cardboard and hand them to your players that way your players can kind of touch them and hold them and fit them together and see how they might join. Or better yet, pick up a very simple four-piece puzzle, and as they discover each piece, hand them a new one, and let them put this puzzle together to make the key for the door. And if you're worried that a four-piece children's puzzle is going to be too difficult for your players to solve, Dungeon Masters can easily mark or color the pieces in a way that way it's obvious to see how they go together once the players get all four pieces. The point is not to make the puzzle difficult. The point is to make the pieces tactile, you know, something that they can touch. Once they enter the central room, the heroes are whisked away to sort of a pocket dimension of the distant past, back when the tower still stood. And now they can explore this tower and get to the gym. Each level follows a different elemental theme and has monsters accordingly. Air, earth, water, and fire. And while challenging, I think it would preferred more elemental, or at least more elemental planar creatures that are guarding some of these levels. Because, you know, a Medusa covering the earth level, eh, it just eh, doesn't really hit for me. Eventually, the heroes will reach the top of the tower where the soul gym awaits. The gym does try to protect itself, and once the party enters, it fires a blast of light down one of the pie wedge sections of the room. After the first one, which is designed to miss, but give the players a warning that this sort of thing is about to start happening, the blasts are random and come every single round. If a character is inside of a section that gets hit by this light, they must make a saving throw. And if that saving throw succeeds, then all of their possessions and themselves are permanently bleached white. Magical items are said to be drained by this blast, but I'd allow a saving throw for each of their items because the player did make their saving throw versus this. But if the character fails their saving throw against this blast of light, then their soul is ripped out of their body and goes screaming and sucked into the gym while the rest of the player characters watch in complete horror. Once the PCs manage to get the gym outside of its protective sphere, they can, you know, grab the amulet and all hold hands and push the buttons and get whisked away back to their present time where the Duke and the Seer are waiting. The Seer can free the soul of any trapped player character and bring them back to life, providing, of course, the rest of the party or the group brought the body back with them. We were supposed to bring the bodies back? Ah, oh, crap. We left those back at the tower. Or another body could be substituted if they don't have the player character's old body. Interesting. Hey guys, I'm gonna go find a body for our friend Soul to occupy, and uh, it's probably best that you don't ask me where I got it. At this point, the adventure is done. If you're running this as a tournament game, points are totaled up and compared to see how each group performed. If this is done as part of a regular campaign, then experience points are issued out to the player characters who then go charging off on their next adventure. Overall, I find Ghost Tower of Inverness to be an okay adventure. Some of the ideas in the puzzles are pretty fun, but it's not enough to make this a great adventure. And it's probably best that Dungeon Masters, you know, use this as sort of an idea mine, that way they can get some of the really cool like tricks and traps and go ahead and incorporate them into their own games that they write. Now that's of course if you're going to be running this as a regular campaign adventure, which of course is not what it was designed to be. As a tournament adventure, that's a different story, and I personally love the fact that they kept the rules for it to be this used as a tournament game. Unfortunately, since this is game is from an edition that was four D&D editions ago, it probably doesn't get much opportunity to be used the way it was originally designed to be used. But with the small and growing old school RPG market out there, I would love to see this adventure get some more tournament play at different conventions or game shops in the future. Or it could be used as a way that Dungeon Masters could kind of analyze this, kind of break it apart, and make their own tournament games because you can see very clearly you know, how the scoring process and all that was put together. So maybe they could use that formula and they could put together some sort of old school tournament games the way they used to do them back in the day. But if you're going to be trying to work this into your regular D&D campaign, Dungeon Masters are going to need to do some work. I think the Seer would make a great future villain, you know, as the PCs, you know, get him the stone and then he reveals his true nature. Or maybe he really is a good guy but gets corrupted by the Soul Gym's power. 
Or maybe he's just a red herring. The seer, you know, he could be a totally good guy. Just nobody trusts him because he's all Mr. Mysterious. But the Duke? Yeah, that's the guy who becomes the villain. Maybe the Soul Gym is needed to be part of a regular campaign, such as the player character's enemies are trying to get the Soul Gym, and that's why the player characters do this job in order to get to it first. Or maybe they're needing some information to complete the quest of their larger campaign. But the only person that knows the information that the player characters need, their soul was trapped inside the soul gym long ago. So the player characters have to go to the tower, get the gym, get the gym back to the seer, so the seer can pull the soul of this person out. That way the player characters can learn the information that they need for their much larger campaign. Yeah, those big elaborate plots that stretch across a campaign, those are cool and all. I just prefer the old eviction approach. How do you mean? I mean that the castle itself is the prize. You know, let's say the player characters do some sort of big favor for the Duke, or maybe one of the PCs gets to be that level where they get to have their own keep, and the Duke is all, hey, I got a perfectly good castle that ain't nobody using. A good fixer-upper opportunity, if you ask me. There's just one small thing you gotta get out of it first before I let you have it. So you're not clearing the place out for the Duke, but the player characters are clearing it out for themselves. Exactly. The player characters pull up to the castle with a U-Haul full of their crap, and then they proceed to go about evicting all the monsters and getting rid of all the junk left behind by the previous tenant. The whole time calling dibs on who gets to have which room. And any time a wizard casts a fireball and causes a cave-in, the rest of the party is all like, Whoa, whoa, whoa! Stop messing up our stuff! You are cleaning that up, buddy! Oh, wow. Yeah, it could be like one of those extreme house makeover shows, but in D&D characters renovating old castles. I dig it. Speaking of modifying a module, you ever gonna share the story how you guys did that Hellraiser mod? Well, there's not much to say about it. I mean, the heroes have to assemble a puzzle to open a gate to enter another world, fight its denizens, then face a revolving beacon of light to get to the prize. All pretty self-explanatory, if you ask me. You can find the module in DriveThruRPG. It's definitely not for everyone, but is a cool time capsule of an old-school funhouse tournament dungeon with a lot of cool ideas inside. Now a word from our sponsor about something new for Dungeons & Dragons. Peterson Games is happy to announce the release of Dark Worlds Act 1, The Ritual, part of the ongoing Cthulhu Mythos Saga, available via subscription October 2020. Subscribe now to get fresh horror delivered to your doorstep every month. Each act is a hardcover book with 75 full-color pages and over 30 illustrations, filled with new monsters to fight and new locations to explore. Dark Worlds is the newest 5e D&D campaign by Sandy Peterson, creator of Call of Cthulhu. You and your friends become unwitting pawns caught up in the blunders of a mad ruler. His insane attempt to curry favor with the dread fungi from Yugoth results in your being teleported across space to the nightmare world of Yugoth. In Act 1, The Ritual. The Ritual keeps you alive. For now. But for how long? Your only hope is to track down the wizard Mustafa, who knows the spell of return. Unfortunately, he's been taken by the fungi for their dire purposes, and your attempts to rescue him have drawn their attention. Click the link below to learn more and enter Dark Worlds. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews and how-tos, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, heroes! You have a great day. You know, between the real estate eviction angle and that fire giant that you find up inside the ghost tower, this adventure would be a great Scott Brown bonesaw mashup.